come now and come with more power. For the sake of Jesus Christ, come Holy Spirit, come now and come with more power. For the sake of Jesus Christ, come now, come now with more power in your precious name. And Father, we put on the whole armor of God, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. And having done so, Lord, we stand firm on the rock of salvation. Thank you, God, you are healing me now. Thank you, Jesus, you are healing me now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, you are healing me now. Thank you, Holy Trinity, you are healing me now. Amen. Good morning, lovely people. Somebody once said that to preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. I'd just like to sit here for an hour and say nothing and smile at you. <laughs> Talking of smiling, how many of you, when you woke up, the first thing you did, how many of you smiled? Well done, well done. Okay, how many of you didn't smile? Okay, why not? Okay. How many of you feel different this morning having smiled? Well done. Why? Joy. Yes. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well done. If you didn't this, this morning, try it tomorrow. Okay? Seriously. It's very important. So being a new grandfather, I've got a couple of one-liners for you. Great song by Johnny Nash. I can't see clearly now. From Carly Simon, you're so varicose vain. From the Who, talking about my medication. From the Commodores, once, twice, three trips to the bathroom. <laughs> From the Bee Gees, how can you mend a broken hip? <laughs> Nancy Sinatra, these boots give me arthritis. <laughs> From the Beatles. I get by with a little help from Depends. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little below the belt. I do apologize. Oh. And from the drugs, ball thing. You make my heart sing. <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this from Marvin Gray. I heard it through the grape nuts. <laughs> Isn't it great getting old? It really is. It's lovely. And my favorite one, I do apologize, from the Rolling Stones. You can't always pee when you want to. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord, I'm sorry. And I learned a new a word yesterday. You know, you can teach an old dog new tricks. I learned a, a new word yesterday. We were talking about extroverts and introverts. And I found out somebody very kindly handed me a piece of paper with the name of the people who were in between extrovert and introvert. It's ambivert. Isn't that interesting? Ambidextrous obviously comes from the word ambi, ambivert. So how many of you are ambiverts? Look at that. Wow. Wait a minute. That was, that was like 50% more than yesterday. <laughs> but you've changed overnight. Bless you people. Yeah. The thing about being an ambivert is that you get the best of both worlds. You're able to tap into the strength of both introverts and extroverts as needed. And I think that's... No, 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 no. That's... Much better. Well done. Well done. I just um, really want to get a photograph of that. I have to share, the Lord really put it on my heart last night to, when you were smiling, you know, you, ca you can't see yourselves. And the smile I saw yesterday, this beautiful smile. Can you recreate that, please, on, on, on your right? Let me, come on, are you, and you're in front, right there. Big smile. Come on. Come on. Great big smile. Come on. Even more. Even more. You can do it. Come on. And let me see this side. Big smile. Big smile. If anybody's in the witness protection program, put your, <laughs> put your hands over your face. We don't want to see you. Okay. There we go. All right. Now this side, would you put your arms up as if you're going to do brilliant? Ready? And go. Brilliant. That was wonderful. Okay. Ready? And this side. Arms up. Ready? Go. Brilliant. That was fantastic. I once uh, gave a talk on courage and... Uh, Remember the lion in, uh, in the movie um, 
thank you, the, the Wizard of Oz. I nearly said one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> um, you know, he sang that great song, If I Were King of the Forest, you know, and I love doing that because everybody's, you know, this little bit wiggles, you know. So you guys look over this side, all right? You look at these guys, come on. And I want you to look that way, and I want you to sing, If I were king of the forest, okay? All right, ready? Ready? This side. If I were king of the forest. Well done. Now let's see this side do it. You watch them, all right? Ready? One, two, three. If I were king of the forest. <laughs> that was, isn't that fun? Isn't that great? Oh, lovely. Courage. You know, we've got to have courage in ministry, you know. <laughs> Step out of your comfort zone, you know. So my grandson was visiting one day. He asked, Grandpa, do you know how you and God are alike? And I'm, oh, yes, polish my halo. Oh, that's fantastic. I said, no, how are we alike? He said, you're both old. <laughs> and a little girl was diligently pounding away on her grandfather's word processor computer. She told him she was writing a story. What's it about? He asked. I don't know, she replied. I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, um, in my prayer for you, uh, the Lord put on my heart 2 Corinthians 1.10. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. And the Lord put it on my heart this morning in prayer to make your yes, yes, and your amen, amen in Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yeah? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, 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 Lord. So this morning I had a really good breakfast. You all have, The food here is great, isn't it? It's really good food. Um, having breakfast, I was talking to somebody who was talking about the call to ministry, and he was discerning the call to ministry and praying about possibly being a pastor. And he was looking for signs. How many of you look for signs? How many of you look for signs when you're driving? <laughs> yeah. Less of you? Whoa, dear, that's, that's, this statistics is not working. We, we shouldn't do statistics from this group. That doesn't make sense. But anyway, never mind. So he was talking about driving. He was doing about 35, and he saw a butterfly flying along. And it came in and landed on his shoulder. I mean, that's a sign, isn't it? That was beautiful. And it reminded me of a few years ago. I was in upstate New York coming back from a busy day. The sun was setting. It was cool. I had all my windows open, it was for the fall, it was one of those beautiful evenings, and a bat flew in my car. <laughs> There's your sign, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, no kidding, um, if my wife had been sitting in the passenger seat, it would have been in her face. It actually hit the headrest of the, of the passenger seat, and I am like, Ugh! you know, I mean, I'm really frightening. Bats to me are rats with wings, and I don't like rats. And I don't like bats. I really don't. And I freaked out, you know. I was like a little girl, you know. <laughs> that was a bit deep, uh, you know. <laughs> Holy moly. But anyway, I pulled off. I was on the bridge, the, the, just a new bridge. It was quite wide, and I'm parked there. And I get out of the car, and I'm standing there with the doors open on, the, on this side. And do you know what? This is a small village of Greenwich, upstate New York. And, of course, a police car happened to come around the corner. I'm in my collar, you know. So a police car comes around and he says, drops his window, he said, are you okay? I said, no, not really, there's a bat in my car. He said, I hate bats. <laughs> I said, so do I. He said, I hate him, I hate him. You know, so he, he turned around the back of my car, put his lights on. No, he didn't, no, he didn't put his lights on. But he, <laughs> so he puts his gloves on. He said, I really hate bats, you know. He said, I'll, I'll look for, with you, you know. So we opened all the car doors and here is the priest with his collar, with his car being searched by the police. <laughs> Well, the entire town of Greenwich, New York, drives by. It's like, what's that priest been up to, you know? So humiliating, you know. But, but that wasn't the end of the story. So the cop says, listen, um, I would go to the, a mechanic and give him 100 bucks cash and say, would you search through my car? Well, I gave him 50 bucks and he searched through my car. Couldn't find the bat. You know, the next morning I'm like, Ugh, you know, sunroof open, all the windows open, you know. Wearing, you know, oh man, I said, oh. I, was, <laughs> you know, I don't want to bat in my car, you know. Uh, and, and anyway, that afternoon, so it hadn't bitten me, it hadn't appeared, but uh, I was in shorts, big mistake. Um, I'm driving, and suddenly I felt a tickle on my leg. <laughs> ah! You know, God's got a wicked sense of humor. 
because I know that was from God. It was a little white moth this big. <laughs> Just tickled my calf. I'm like, oh, God, you got me on that one, you know. <laughs> oh, gee, you know. So now my car has screens on it. <laughs> Not really, but thank you for that person I had breakfast with to remind me. It's funny how memories are triggered, isn't it? You know, And in this ministry, of course, we deal with dealing with memories a lot. Um, this morning, I want to talk about default. What is your default? Where do you go when you're triggered? Lovely saying, of course, your family pushes your buttons. They installed them. <laughs> Thanksgiving is coming up. Remember those little... Uh, uh, Remember those. So, Bible verse Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. Let's start thinking about that as our new default, our new go-to place. Isaiah, can you say Isaiah? Well done. English lesson overdone for today. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Isn't that lovely? I hear confession every day, all day. People dump their stuff out. And it's beautiful that we are set free through the gifts of confession. The road to Emmaus, such a lovely story. I'm going to read from Luke 24, 13 and on. Now, that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. You know this story. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? How embarrassing that must have been. Don't you know what's been going on? And he's talking to Jesus, the poor guy. And, and Jesus is probably like this, you know, he said, Wow, oh, man, you know. Oh, <laughs> what th- Jesus says, what things? You know, he's acting. I love this. Jesus is acting, isn't he? He's obviously acting, you know, uh, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, ab- before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. He's like, really? It doesn't say that, but that's what I imagine it would say. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going on further. They still didn't know who he was, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Isn't it beautiful? He was made known in the breaking of the bread. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They stood still, their faces downcast. What is that expression? Sadness. What else? Depression, exactly. They were terribly depressed. I love to read body language. I watch people like a hawk. I was ministering to somebody in prison who was boldly telling me what a great liar he was. His dad taught him how to lie. I said, no, he didn't. He said, your body language, everything you've told me is an absolute lie. Your body language gives, you, gives it away. 
yesterday we were praying for somebody. It was very sweet. She made an, made this body language like that. I don't know where you are. I won't point you out. I can't see you. Uh, yes, I can, but I won't point you out. <laughs> I tell you what, it's lovely watching body language because it was like this. It was like a resolve. Yeah. It was like, yeah, play ball. Yeah, let's go to, not play ball. What's that pose anyway? You know, I mean, it was like, yes, you know. And it reminded me of a military guy I worked with years ago. He was in Vietnam. He was a bombardier. He dropped more than half a million ordnance, half a million pounds of ordnance on Vietnam. And his body language was fascinating. He was sitting down and he kept doing this. And I asked him, what are you doing? He says, I don't know, I wasn't even aware of it. But military flight suits include a pad that they can write on. He's right-handed, and he wrote the coordinates of the bombing run on his, on his leg. And he was subconsciously rubbing those away. And he didn't realize it. He was just as if he was trying to put away the past, to rub out what he had to do. He never obviously knew how many people had died from the bombing runs, but there were hundreds, at least hundreds, probably more than that. So it's fascinating watching people's expression in ministry. I would say that they were so depressed that they did not even recognize Jesus. Such is the nature of depression. Some acts of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Had they gone to their own personal default, a place we all recognize and go to in stress, fear, anxiety, and worry. By the way, if you worry, you die. And if you don't worry, you die. So why worry? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please don't worry. It's a total waste of time. It really is. Not from the Lord. Get behind me, worry. So what is your default rhetorical? Think about that. What is your default? Where do you go when you are challenged? When somebody says something that gets under your skin, when something happens that puts you in a place of depression, that knocks you off your pedestal a bit. I love what happened next with the disciples. Think of what the disciples did after Jesus was... Crucified. That happened yesterday too, didn't it? It's a sign. <laughs> Wait a minute, it's turned red. Whoa! <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? I've always wanted to do that, you know, preaching, particularly on that particular one. I wanted to have a, you know, my glass here and have a, have some sachet in my hand and just do this, you know. Oh, it turned red. Whoa! Wouldn't that be brilliant, you know? So. But listen, what did they do after this? What did they do? They went fishing, right? Was that their default? Did they go back to their default? Did they go back to something they could do together? Why did they go fishing? It's their default. It's what they knew before the Lord called them from being fishermen. But what happened when they went fishing? Remember, they were fishing all night. What happened? Nothing. They didn't catch a single fish, right? Not one fish until a stranger on the beach said, cast your net on the other side. I love that, <laughs> I love that cartoon, don't you, of, of, of this guy, Peter. He's got cast the nets like this, and he's doing this. You know. And the other, the other disciple says, he said, cast your nets, not cast the nets. You know. <laughs> you know, it's very important to understand what people say in ministry, isn't it? Yeah. You said what? Cast your nets? No, no, cast your yeah, nets. Communication is so important, it really is. So they see this man. They didn't even recognize him this time, although I think they might have done. And you remember how many fish they caught? Well done. Who said that? Well done. Well done. Bless you. Take the rest of the day off. <laughs> 153 fish. You know? That's a lot of fish, isn't it? If I was a fisherman and I caught that many fish, I'd be pretty proud of myself. Again, they did not recognize Jesus as he, as he said, come over here and have breakfast. I think this is fantastic. He's got a fire going. He's got a fish on the fire. You know, he's got some bread. The guy's just been resurrected. Where the heck did he get all that stuff? Have you ever thought of that? You know, he knew what was about to happen. He knew his buddies had been out all night fishing, hadn't caught a thing. I think this is hysterical. Or is it just me? I... I <laughs> 
I think this is so funny because this is human nature, isn't it? Here the, the disciples go into their default. So, oh man, this is all we know, you know, uh, and Jesus is gone. Can you imagine what they felt like? And they go back to that default. This is what we know. This is our comfort zone, okay? They go out fishing and don't catch a thing. Until what? Until Jesus shows up. I love this story. It fires me up, as perhaps you can see. You know, this is fantastic. So, you know, <laughs> beautiful stuff. So, what do you do when you're challenged or trigger, triggered in life? Do you go to your cave and lick your wounds, gentlemen? We're professional cave dwellers, by the way, ladies. Sometimes we want you to come in our cave and sometimes we don't. That means no. <laughs> Back off. Let me ponder my stuff and lick my wounds in my cave. Do you shut down? Do you lash out in anger? Do you sulk? I'm not going to ask any of you who are sulkers. Do you go off in a huff? <laughs> my dog does that. <laughs> if he doesn't get his way, he goes... Phew. He cracks us up. He's so funny. He huffs. I've got a huffing dog. <laughs> do you need a cool down period? Do you need a time out? How do, you, how do you deal with your own hissy fits or other people's hissy fits? How do you deal with that? Yeah? When I owned a business, I had eight employees, two locations, picture framing. And I had a rule, two rules actually. Number one rule was don't bleed on the artwork. When I first became a framer, I cut every finger on my hands. Every, every finger had band-aids on it, you know, because you're dealing with glass all the time. But that was rule number one. The second rule was, if you're in a bad mood, you are to declare it. You are to declare it. And I pray those of you with teenagers, perhaps you might like to think about that. Yeah? It's amazing. If you declare you're in a bad mood, it doesn't last. You know, Monday mornings were hysterical in my business. Particularly with Chris, who'd come in miserable chap, you know. He'd come in in a filthy mood. <laughs> and, you know, in 10 minutes we were cracking up laughing, you know. Laughing with him, of course, not at him. Someone once told me her friend owned a doll-making factory. She would not let her staff paint a face on, a, on the dolls if they were in a bad mood. Isn't that wisdom? Do we take out our anger or disappointments on others? The adage, we only hurt the one we love, might come into play, because we do. I interviewed a few people on this subject. Some said that they were, if they were in a bad mood, they would say, leave me alone, or I need a hug. One person said that she told people to walk away from her. I need you to leave now. Thank you. Perhaps we can talk later. That's setting a healthy boundary. Yeah. Get out of my face. My dad, 28 years ago, taught me two words. He said, one word. He said, no, is a complete sentence. That really changed my life. He also said, be available. As Francis said, have fun. And I want to pass that on to you again, that have fun. I know I talk about, talked about that yesterday, but please have fun. Enjoy your life. Um, I was at a uh, bar mitzvah years ago. The rabbi, a lovely young rabbi woman, said to the four boys being, whatever the word is, uh, she said four questions. Three I forget because they were uh, from the Torah. But the fourth one was, when you go to heaven, you'll be asked, did you have fun? Isn't that lovely? So can I boldly give you permission to have fun? Can I do that? I don't want to be, I don't want to be arrogant in this. I just want you to have fun. Doesn't God want you to have fun? Can you give yourself permission to smile and to enjoy this life as short as it is? Have great joy. Enjoy that joy. More joy, more joy. More joy, more joy, more joy. I speak joy into your heart. More joy. More joy. More joy. I don't want to be aggressive or regret my words or actions later, she said. How do you react when someone around you is in a bad mood? I think the default for that is, what have I done to upset you? And often the time, we've done nothing. It's not you. But in my case, it's always me, but never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fantastic forgiving wife. Perhaps the analogy of an escape hatch or a way out, a diffusing situation is needed. This is all good boundary setting. How would this person in a bad mood like to be treated while in this state of mind? When I married my wife, um, 
I have post-traumatic stress, and I don't like people coming up, up behind me. Yet last night, somebody came up to me and nearly fell off my chair. It's not good to fall on the floor when you've got bad hips <laughs> or bad lungs. And, you know, that is the an exaggerated startle response is what's left is the remnant of having post-traumatic stress. Uh, the other remnant is when I'm in, in severe stress, I do tend to stutter still, but that's only in front of my wife. I luckily don't really do that in public, thank God. Very embarrassing. Hate that about myself. But one day I confessed to Lynn that I hated that when I'm stressed that I stutter. And she gave me a great big smile and said, that's what I love about you. And I was so ashamed of that remnant. She said, that's what I love about you. Showing that strength in weakness, in knowing that uh, I'm not comfortable. She's only the one who sees that now. But for six months, well, for a week I couldn't speak and <laughs> for six months I had a really bad stutter. And my heart goes out to those who stutter. So perhaps we need to ask the person the, what the best thing would be. And that's what I did for Lynn. I taught her, don't wake me up. If you do, do it with a long stick. <laughs> Don't ever surprise me. Don't ever come back behind me. You can throw me a surprise birthday party. That's all right. But just don't do anything behind me. You know? So we set healthy boundaries. And I said to her, listen, when I'm in a funk, when I'm in PTSD mode, uh, I will either invite you to give me a hug or just leave me in space. We needed to agree that when we weren't, when neither of us was stressed to agree to disagree or to set those healthy boundaries. Very important. So you could ask leading questions. When you're in a funk, do you want me to ignore you? Do you want me to leave you alone? Do you want me to leave you in your cave licking your wounds? Do you want me to give you a hug? What do you want? What do you need? How would you like to be treated when triggered? Would you say that with me? How would you like to be treated when triggered? That could change your life with your spouse, with your loved ones, with anybody. This also, of course, would apply to those suffering from post-traumatic stress, combat wounds, or combat in the household, or combat in the office space, or the Me Too issues. We all have buttons. And we all know how to push each other's buttons. And we need to respect that. So the word default is normally used as a failure to do something required by duty or law. It could mean a failure to pay financial debts, but I use this definition today from the word taken from computer language. A computer default is a selection automatically used by a program in the absence of a choice made by the user. I'm going to say that again because this is important. It's a computer default is a selection automatically used by a program in the absence of a choice made by the user. Think about that. Think about the analogy of a computer in your brain. It is described as a pre-selected option adopted by a computer program. I would argue that we as humans have a default not unlike the computer. We were born with little computers. We don't come with a manual, do we? And we're all so different. Sometimes that manual needs to be rewritten as we grow. We have our automatic selection in times of stress, depression, and life's changes. An example would be, what is your d default when a driver who does not stop at a red light and turns right in front of you, causing you to urgently brake? What, what is your default? What is your reaction? Come on. Be honest. Be honest, Christians. You're driving along. You've got a green light, and you're just la, la, la. Whoa, you idiot. Jerk. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The honesty. I used to make a certain hand sign. I won't do it. Uh, when I wear a collar, you can't really go around the place doing that, you know. So I do, do a different hand sign. I do this. And I tell you what, it blesses me. You idiot, you know. What are, what are the, come on, be honest, gents, anybody. Somebody cuts you off, what do you do? I'm going to pray for you. Well done. Yeah, listen to that passion. I'm going to, I love that. Well done. How does that make you feel? <laughs> That's lovely. Do you pray for him or her? <laughs> I'm sure you didn't. I'm sure you didn't. Anybody else? What what happened? What's that? How beautiful. That's lovely. Somebody said something over here. Jesus. 
Good for you.